Temple University. This is Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with authors and illustrators prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter, Professor of Children's Literature with Temple University. Hello, I'm Jacqueline Schachter. I'm a professor of children's literature at Temple University. I'm pleased to welcome to our Profiles in Literature series the outstanding poet, Eve Merriam. Miss Merriam has conducted a weekly modern poetry session for a New York radio station, written a daily verse column for the newspaper PM, and won a grant to write poetic drama for the Columbia Broadcasting System. She often writes free verse. Here is a sample, some little poems without the word love from the book Finding a Poem. Where else would I take my troubles? In French, joie is a rhyme for toi. When it rains, I miss you. And when it stops, then too. Every morning when I awaken, I open the cage of my heart and your name flies out. Joining me in discussion with Miss Merriam is Carolyn Field, Director of the Office on Work with Children of the Free Library of Philadelphia, and Dr. Miriam Wilt, a Temple professor nationally known in the field of children's literature. We'll begin with a question by Dr. Wilt. I have a rather simple question. <clears throat> do you write for children and adults, or do you just write? You call that a simple question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very complex. Um, I think that probably I just write. Uh, you use different parts of yourself at different times. I think, as a poet, you don't even look for it, but there's a certain expression and image that you may come to, and there's a, you hope, a freshness about it. Sometimes I recall my older little boy, the first time that he saw snow, we were out in it, and I had always thought snow was cold, and he was rolling around in it and tasting it, and I realized that, of course, snow is warm, and you can play with it, and you can have a wonderful time with it. And many years later, that evolved into a poem, which some of you may know. It's a poem called Cliché, and it's in It Doesn't Always Have to Rhyme. And there's a part that goes in, um, what's the warmest thing you know? You know, it might even be snow, which I had gotten from observing my youngster. But I think that uh, you can't really slot yourself and say, OK, this is for children, this is for grown-ups, because just like the old story, what is it, about the fat man, where he said inside all of every fat man there is a thin man escaping. Uh, all of us, of course, are children all our lives. And I think, conversely, children are very adult in some ways. Children have very wise ways at times of looking at the world. I don't want to be a Rousseauist because I don't really think that children are perfect human beings and then become corrupted. But I do think that uh, children connect to the world and that we can learn from them and they can learn from us and sometimes we can relearn joy from one another. I don't know if that answers it at all. Well, that question, I'll have to butt in here because that relates to your inner city mother goose in a way. Did you <laughs> write that for adults or again, did you, were you thinking of children when you wrote it? Because when you say mother goose, one thinks of a poem for children. Yes. And to me, with all due respect, this is not a book for children. No, it is not. It's it an is adult for adults. Book. It's for mature people. Right. And uh, I know in the library, we've had a lot of people calling and saying, do you have the Eve Merriam inner city mother goose? And what age, a grade should it be for, third or fourth? And I say it's 14th. It's for <laughs> adults. Yes. Uh, the book came about because I wanted very much to say something about cities and about what life is like today. 
and I was casting about for a form. And it just was very strange and almost freaky. One day I was on the subway, and I've never had this happen to me before or after, but it was almost like a comic strip, you know, where a light bulb goes on in the head, and you see it. And lines actually said themselves to me, and the lines said, there was a man of our town, and he was wondrous wise. He moved away. And I thought, aha, the first part is Mother Goose. And then another voice said to me, Mary, Mary, Urban Mary, how does your sidewalk grow? And I thought, I can take Mother Goose. And as I began to think about it, I did a lot of research into Mother Goose, and I found out that Mother Goose originally was not a series of verses for children at all. It was very sophisticated political and social commentary of the 18th century times, and many of the characters were actual historical figures. So that it didn't seem to me that I was defaming Mother Goose, although I was brought up on Mother Goose when I was a youngster, and I think it's one of the things that helped make me a, a poet. Um, unlikely as it may seem, when I went to grammar school in Philadelphia, we used to read the Psalms at the beginning of class, and I am not a religious person at all, but I do think that the Psalms in the Bible are among the most beautiful poetry in the world. So I had those for beauty, and I had Mother Goose rhymes for bounce and jollity, and I think I was very fortunate. But um, when I wrote The Inner City Mother Goose, it never occurred to me that it would be taken for a children's book. And it's just astonishing what has happened. It is used in colleges, and it is used in some high schools, but I have heard stories of it filtering down to all levels. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think I must be the only author I know of who has prevented sales of an author's own book. I was in a bookstore, and a woman who didn't know who I was picked it up, and she saw the title, and she said, oh, I think I'll buy this for my grandchild. And I said, excuse me, madam, how old is your grandchild? And she said, eight. I said, I've read that book, and if I were you, I wouldn't buy it. Oh, I'm sure your publisher's not going to like that. <laughs> no, I think they should. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, I mean, it, it's just one must be direct, one must be straightforward. It, it's just too tiresome not to be. Life is too short. I'm sorry that I didn't introduce. That's quite all right. Uh, Mrs. <laughs> Carolyn Field <laughs> is the... Uh, I want to, I'm going to do it before she asks her next question. She is the director of the Office on Work with Children of the Free Library of Philadelphia and co-sponsor with Temple of our series of videotape. Now, well, now, I have a problem, and I, I was looking over some new Only books one? today. <laughs> well, one problem relates to poetry, because in spite of the fact that you imply in your little leaflet on uh, poetry that anyone can, uh, well, anyone can enjoy poetry or even write poetry or compose it. I'm not too sure about that being non-composable. I don't know if I said can write it. Well, it sort of implies that, what can a poem do or something. But anyway, it seems recently that a lot of uh, poets are coming out with um, poetry for the preschool child that has no caps, no punctuation. Now, this poetry may be, it may be the way the child speaks himself, but the poetry will be read by an adult to the child. You see, an adult. And many adults do not have the ability to relate as a poet does who writes it, or as a child might who hears it. And I noticed in some of your books that you had some poems that did not have caps or punctuation. Yes. Would you mind saying something uh, about that? I'd, I'd be to happy do. to. Um, I think that it depends on the, the, the poem and the time. Sometimes I find, and I think other poets do too, that if you don't have a capital letter at the beginning of a line, it isn't jarring. You get a smoother trip, and it's simpler to read, actually, because sometimes people will read a line of a poem, and then it's like the little bell ringing it with a typewriter line, and then, you know, you come back and you have to start all over again. Mm -hmm. So when you get accustomed to it, I think it, it can be easier. and. Sometimes without punctuation, it's just a matter of having breathing pauses, or you don't want to imply that you should have the length of a comma or the length of a semicolon. I think that if a poet is successful in the inner rhythm, never mind rhyme, I think very often for quite young children, they prefer rhyme and That's right. that satisfaction mm -hmm. like of Mother Goose. words mm -hmm. coming together, mm -hmm. yes, and, and that chime at the end of the line. But um, I think, like anything else in life, it's just a matter of getting accustomed to it. First of all, I have only one rule for reading poetry. Do not read poetry. Only reread it. You must give it the courtesy of two readings, because 
the main difference between poetry and prose is that poetry has a built-in rhythm. There is a sense of music. So read it the first time to get the sense, whatever sense is there. Even if it's complete nonsense, there's a certain kind of logic to that nonsense. And the second time, for the music, whether it's alliteration, assonance, whatever it is, there is some kind of music in those lines. So if you would just pay that courtesy of rereading poetry rather than poetry, I think maybe the problem of punctuation and capitals will take care of itself. Well, I'm afraid that the adult who takes a book home won't reread. This is it. The they'll try to read it the first time, and they can't do it. It doesn't uh, sing for them the first time, and that they, they put it away, and then the child will be deprived of it because it's the adult that gives it to the child. Well, so. then perhaps they'll get to another book. Uh, I would urge at libraries, and I would urge teachers, I think it would be very nice in stamping out a book of poetry to suggest it or to get up a little bookmark, perhaps. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Please read me twice. <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> Questions are in order from our guests. Mr. Joseph Robinson, principal of Douglas Elementary School. Thank you, Dr. Schachter. Well, Miss Merriam, it's been perfectly delightful to hear a real honest-to-goodness poet read and, Without horns. <laughs> <laughs> read and recite her own works. Uh, it had a, a certain charm about it and a certain warmth. And um, I had the feeling that uh, the poet herself was communicating something in the uh, area of, of spiritual values, uh, something that was emotional. And I'm sure it had that kind of impact on us. I wonder in these days when we talk about cognitive learnings and effective learnings and when the regular classroom teacher usually is uh, clobbered in the cognitive field where you're teaching technical aspects of language mm -hmm. and things of this mm -hmm. kind. I wonder if uh, you would uh, give an opinion on this, whether perhaps the beautiful side of language uh, should be put in the hands of someone who does have that feeling and that talent and that ability to communicate. Wouldn't this help us and wouldn't it help children to discover the beauty of expression, just as we invite music teachers and art teachers to uh, share their specialties. Oh, definitely. While you were talking, I was thinking what a nice alliterative phrase, clobbered by the cognitive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, well, I, I do, and I, I know that other poets do too, uh, get around to schools from time to time. And as a matter of fact, last spring, I spent a week as poet in residence in a series of black schools in, in Cleveland, working with the children for a week. And um, I've done that in other cities. I've done it in the Midwest. I do it sometimes in the East. I'm going out to Washington State next month to do that for a few days. I think there's no question that um, when you hear somebody reading something that they have participated in and they are excited about the work they do, I don't care what it is, if a carpenter is excited about his or her work, it's beautiful for a child to see that, to see how to use a plane, to see how to hammer a nail straight. Similarly with the tools of language. Uh, and I think it's also a help for teachers because we tend to blame teachers a lot, but I think sometimes teachers get overblamed because they do have such an enormous curriculum to have to go through. And they are responsible for teaching a lot of things. And it's hard for them so that I think poets can come into the schools as teachers' helpers. Uh, and I think that they can read poetry aloud. They can perhaps get the children a little less inhibited than they may have been and help the teachers to be a little less inhibited. What I like to do is not only read to the children, but I feel it's even more valuable to have sessions with the teachers because the teachers are the ones who are going to have to go back and work with many children. There's a request, Miss Merriam, for you to render some more poems. This is TV. In the house of Mr. and Mrs. Spouse, he and she would watch TV, and never a word between them spoken until the day the set got broken. Then how do you do, said he to she. I don't believe that we've met yet. Spouse is my name. What's yours, he asked. Why, said she, my name's the same. Uh, do you suppose that we could be? But the set came suddenly right about, and so they never did find out. Oh, <laughs> uh, darling. Um, 
This is a little more serious. This is a very short poem. It's a future poem called Fantasia. I dream of giving birth to a child who will ask, Mother, what was war? And this is, um, this is one that I like to read. I really should dedicate this to my older son who um, is very big on music and sounds. It's called Umbilical. You can take away my mother, you can take away my sister, but don't take away my little transistor. I can do without sunshine, I can do without spring, but I can't do without my ear to that thing. I can live without water in a hole in the ground, but I can't live without that sound, that sound, that sound, that sound. <laughs> Very good. We have questions from some of our guests. The author, Max Rosenfeld. Something you said at the beginning about uh, those poems that you were reading, which tried to express love without using the word love, yes. recalled something to me. goes back a few years. A book that you published, I believe it was called The Double Bed. And I remember one poem in there about Eskimos. Yes, that they the had Eskimos no, have no word for no divorce. Word for divorce. Is that still true? And what was the symbol of the kayak, the, uh, the, the, the boat? The Eskimos have no word for divorce, but a boat is called a kayak, a word that you can spell backwards or forwards, and it comes out the same. And unlike an American canoe in which you can tip over and you have to keep your place very carefully, you can sit anywhere you like in a kayak. And I think it's a metaphor for equality in marriage. And that book is being republished with some additional poems. It will be out this April in a new edition. Would, what could one call you then? A premature women's liberation? <laughs> <laughs> I hope a humanist. <laughs> because she was very much in advance of her time. So. I'm, um, I'm very pro-man as well as pro-women. <laughs> We have a question from Dr. Florence Shankman of Temple University, specialist in reading methods. I was wondering what particular things gave you your inspiration to write the various books that you did. Was it something happening at that particular time? Because I noticed the contrast in the poetry that you had in There Is No Rhyme for Silver, as compared to the inner city Mother Goose. Well. Um, as I said, I wanted very much to talk about urban life today. That was the takeoff point for the inner city mother goose. There is no rhyme for silver. It's my first book for children. I had never written poetry for children before that, except isolated ones here and there. And um, I think I was very taken up with the idea of language, <coughs> of the spontaneity of language, the joyfulness in playing around with words, which is something very near and dear to me. And I think you'll find the same thing in my most recent book of poems for youngsters, which is Finding a Poem, and a book that I'm working on now, which will be called Out Loud. Um, all of the poems are more or less onomatopoeic and are designed for reading aloud. Uh, that stemmed out of an actual experience. I had a fascinating time. I was reading poetry to a group of children in another city, and I was told by the teacher that they were retarded readers and she said, you won't be able to keep them for more than 10 minutes, and don't worry if they get restless. And the kids were of all ages, from 6 to about 12, and they came in. And I started out with very young things for them. In fact, they asked for Don't Think About a White Bear. And it sort of bothered me, because here were these big, lunky-looking kids. But I read Don't Think About a White Bear. And then I started to read from Catch a Little Rhyme. And I read the poem about the transistor, Umbilical. And what I found was that these children who couldn't read, these big boys of 11 and 12, I noticed that when I read it the second <coughs> time, these boys were mouthing all the words. They could remember the whole thing. And we had the most exciting hour. We spent a whole hour together before they got tired. And the teacher came to me at the end of the day, and she said it was such a thrilling experience for them, but of course it was for me too. And it seemed to me that there was a kind of breakthrough there that perhaps if there are difficulties in reading, we know that rhyme is helpful. Uh, 
but we haven't explored all sorts of sounds of languages. And I thought what I would like to do was to write a book of poems that would be designed to be read aloud, and I would not stoop down in the vocabulary at all, so that it didn't matter whether you were 6, 7, 14, 15, or 16. And that's the way I'm going about the book. So um, it will be interesting to see what happens. I don't know whether my theory will work out or not, but I'm trying. This is Margaret Ulrich, English Department Head at Jones Junior High. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Merriam. A teacher's greatest boon in the classroom is to be able to supply her students little anecdotes about an author's or a poet's life. Would you tell us something about your memories of Philadelphia? Oh, there are so many. I suppose you know, the first one that comes to my mind, it's very strange how one sense goes into another. Root beer drops. Have any of you ever eaten root beer drops? I used to go to the children's concerts at the Academy of Music, and they would let us out early on Friday afternoon so that we could go. And we would take the train in from Germantown. And I would stop. At that time, they still had the old Chinese wall. And I would buy a package of root beer drops. And for a long time, I associated music with root beer drops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. She was born in Kensington, yeah. Margaret. Yes, I lived there until I was seven. And one of my earliest favorite poems deals with root beer. In, um, and I think I quoted it in that pamphlet, What Can a Poem Do? One of the shortest poems. There was a book that I read when I was a kid called The Story of a Bad Boy. And I remember in it, this boy came and he saw this poem and he thought it was such a beautiful poem because what it said was, root beer sold here. <laughs> <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> Janet, you have a question. Yes, I want to ask you, some famous authors such as Somerset Maugham make lists of words that intrigue them. And you have fa fascinating use of words, and like there is no rhyme for silver, it doesn't always have to rhyme. Do you also make lists of words and thought before composing your poetry? I like to uh, put down words I don't know. Uh, and um, sometimes I will use them for poems. There's a game that my husband and I like to play with friends. Perhaps some of you know it. It's called Fictionary. You go through the dictionary and you pick out a word that nobody knows the meaning of. And then you make up meanings and you try to fool people as to what, what it is. And it's astonishing and it's very humbling because no matter how educated you may think you are, at least I can pick up any page in the dictionary and find many words that I don't know. But there, I like to do that. I think many writers do, of um, the surprise and pleasure of discovering new words. Charles, you have something to I had thought as a teacher that it was always very important with kids to stress the idea of when reading poetry, to make it sound as natural as possible, to ignore the end of the line and go on to complete an idea or to express a thought as it was written there. And yet, there's a whole school of people, such as the Teachers and Writers Collaborative right now, who are mm -hmm. getting into schools and saying exactly the opposite, that with the form of modern, modern poetry as it is, with breaks and lines and all that kind of thing, mm -hmm. you should read it and give it the form that it was written in. And I can know how you feel about that kind of thing. Well, at the risk of sounding like a politician, I believe in both schools. Uh, I think uh, if I had to opt for one or the other, I would opt for yours, because I think the main thing is to be natural, to be relaxed. One of the things that I always tell teachers is, if you make a mistake, go back and start over again. The lucky thing about poetry is that the more times you say it, the better. And. Uh, if you don't understand a poem, say so. That's, maybe we can all find out the meaning, or maybe it isn't terribly important to know everything. Maybe we can just have some pleasure with the words and go on to something else. Uh, so I would prefer to be natural. I think that there is, of course, something to be gained by stops and by pauses in reading a poem. Uh, even the silly little one that I read about TV, one of the things that pleases me about that is that there are not only end rhymes, but uh, when Mr. Spa says, I don't believe that we've met yet. Believe and we've go together and met yet. And I sort of like to say that, you know. Uh, and I think with any poem where there are inner rhymes or just a beat, 
that you get more out of it by stressing what there is. And if a poet will give you helps by showing how the lines are divided, they're not arbitrary, those stops. If a line doesn't end because it's iambic pentameter or it's a regular beat, very often there will be a reason because you want the reader to pause at that word and to think about the next word before it comes. So I think in the long run what it is, it's like that old joke, what is it, a, in the old days of the bop musicians when one says to the other, he's walking down the street and he says, hey man, he says, uh, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And the other one says, practice man, practice. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm going to take issue with you on something you said before about inner city mother goose. Uh, I had the pleasure of testing at your school in a sixth grade classroom uh, some of the inner city mother mm -hmm. goose poems. And I found that uh, Hushabai Baby can readily be understood. It could, that could be understood in a first or second grade class. In other words, selected poems. Oh, I could think even used. Urban Mary could. Everybody uh, has. One of, one of the very, very fine ones to climax a sixth grade unit uh, on uh, taking an active role in city government would be the one about the city hall hearing. That yes, uh, yes. only uh, the cats. It was all about were, cats and their habitats, but they only admitted dogs and rats. <laughs> that one goes over well. Um, I found a poem like Taffy uh, could be used, but the, the children are in danger of generalizing. Yes. And so it's well to use something like Wagner's JT, which shows an honest doorkeeper so that they don't mm -hmm. make, mm -hmm. you know, form an incorrect impression about all storekeepers. But aside from that, uh, I, I just wanted to say selected poems could be used. Well, I know that uh, I get requests from many anthologies and textbooks in the last couple of years of picking up selected poems from it. So they are being used in school books willy-nilly. I just think that there are some that are inappropriate. Just as it, in, at the show at Inner City, although it's, I think, a very sophisticated show and even some rough language, particularly in the second act, uh, We've had many, many high school students come, and we had a couple of junior high school busloads coming in, too. Do you remember Hushabye Baby? Hushabye Baby, on the top floor, project elevator won't work anymore. It comes up to 10 and then starts to stall. We'll have to walk down, baby, carriage and all. You see, that can be well, used. That can be used in lower grades, too. Does anyone have? And last question. Yes, Dr. Kleiner, Sociology Department, Temple. I, uh, I often wonder when a poet uh, writes a poem, to what extent are they concerned about the subtlety of the phrasing they use, or to what extent do they feel they need to express quite bluntly or clearly the point that they're trying to make? Do you worry about whether you're too subtle or too blunt in the points that you want to make? No. Um, I think you must write, first of all, for yourself to discover things, to learn things. And um, if you stop to worry about whether it's too subtle or too blunt, you may wind up being false. Uh, now, there are certain instances. I did a biography of Ben Franklin, lovely hometown boy. Um, and it was designed for third grade readers. So I had to be very careful when I was describing the Stamp Act. It was important to do it in terms that could be understood by an eight-year-old. But I think in poetry, where so much of the richness of language must come across, I would never, never think of being careful of my vocabulary. I mean, one that you mentioned uh, when we were talking before, alligator on the escalator. Those are big words. Mm -hmm. But six-year-olds know escalator. Look at the big words television commercial and yet our two and three-year-olds know those words so I think we have to revise our cat sat on the mat vocabulary according to what children really know thank you miss Marion our guest on profiles in literature has been an author who writes for children and adults her works appearing in numerous books and magazines both in English 
and translation. It's been a pleasure to have you as our guest. I've enjoyed it hugely.